And yeah, I'd like to remind you that the to sign the manifest manifesto that we introduced on our first day. Okay, so so today we will have some very practical lessons, and our first speaker is um, Seth Sacker. Uh, he's a uh, specialized in uh, anal uh, data analysis and. He will uh, discuss about um, qualitative methods, how to analyze uh, qualitative data and using Excel and Word, which sounds very, very useful for us. So I uh, please welcome our speaker for today. Over to you, Mr. Singh. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, good morning or good evening to everybody. Um, yeah, I you know so the intent of my presentation today is to give some very practical ways that we can analyze qualitative data using Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Word. So um, it's going to be very use oriented and will involve a demonstration of a step by step process with the goal that everyone can walk away from the session today with a new tool in their qualitative analysis toolbox. Before doing the demonstration, I will provide a little background on how I came to start using the method and some important definitions that will be used in the webinar. While I will talk about different methods of qualitative analysis and a bit about evaluation design. This webinar is less about that and just more about the process. How can we extract findings from data? Um, please feel free to write questions in the chat and I will attempt to answer as many as I can um, throughout. So, and, and one, one other thing, I will be sharing the screen and I have a few different documents that I will be switching between. And sometimes I forget, or I may forget which document I'm sharing. Um, so if it looks like I am talking about a document that you don't see, if someone could just come on unmute and just say, hey, we don't see that document. And that will tell me, oh, I have to find the correct document to share. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start. And I will pause about halfway through as well to kind of make sure no one has any questions. And just because I know we're in different lo geographic locations right now, so I just kind of want to tell everybody where I am geographically so we can so I can share about myself a little bit. Um, so I am currently in the United States in this red state here in Pennsylvania. Uh, in a city called Philadelphia. And I am originally from this blue state, Oregon, from a city called Portland. And I've had the opportunity and privilege to work in a few countries in the Americas. So I've worked in Mexico, in Colombia, Bolivia, and the Dominican Republic. And so that's just a little bit about me and where I currently am talking to you uh, from. So yeah, I'm currently in this red place in, in Philadelphia. Okay, so I will share the screen now. And also one other thing, just before I start, um, this method too is something that I think can inject transparency into qualitative analysis. There's no real standard. Everyone does qualitative analysis in different ways, and that's great. This method, when appropriate, can also, you know, if you need to explain how you did your analysis to a project coordinator or to a stakeholder, this method can help explain that process because it's all very transparent and all the documentation will be there. So that's another reason why I would like the, pro the um, process that I present is that it's very transparent. Okay, so to start off, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background into how I started using this process for qualitative analysis. 
I was, this is when I was working on evaluation projects in Colombia, and there was a project to understand motivations and incentives for Colombian farmers to implement sustainable agriculture practices and to receive sustainability certifications. It was a mixed methods evaluation, and it included semi-structured interviews with multiple stakeholders. So we had stakeholders that included the farmers, that included the companies that received the farming goods to extract the um, oil, palm oil from it, as well as those who um, gave sustainable sustainability certifications to the farmers. So we were talking to various different stakeholders in this project. It was a team of four, and all of us would be conducting interviews with various stakeholders and analyzing the data. We had different levels of experience in qualitative analysis. Some had zero experience, and some had a lot of experience, and everything in between. And we also had different levels of experience with qualitative analysis tools. Those tools, such as Deduce and Vivo, Atlas TI. Um, and so some had used those, some hadn't used those, though it was irrelevant because we didn't have those tools, nor did we have the funds to purchase those tools. So it didn't really matter our experience with them because we didn't have them anyway. So the first thing we wanted to do was to create a plan for our qualitative analysis and to really understand what our process was going to be. What's the first thing? What's the second thing? What's the third thing that we are going to do in order to gather the data, analyze the data, and be able to present those findings in a clear way to, to our stakeholders? So the first thing we wanted to do was identify the key stakeholders in this project. And we did that through speaking with our community contacts, through reviewing the literature that we had, and through a couple of different methods to, to really understand who it is it that we want to talk to and, and have these interviews with. Once we had that list of stakeholders, we created our interview questions. And this was based off a methodology that we're using um, that, that we were tying the, and, and obviously our evaluation questions as, as well, that we tied our interview questions to. Once we had those questions, then we began to schedule interviews with the different stakeholders. And this was done through a facilitation with our community contacts. Our community contacts really helped us schedule those interviews with, with those different stakeholders. After that, we implemented the interviews. Most of it, that was through Zoom um, because this, this happened during COVID. And so we, we did most of our interviews through Zoom. Once we collected all that data, we arranged the data, we coded the data, which means just reading through all the data and assigning codes that we could analyze later. We identified themes, and then we presented the findings. So this was a nice little process that we had. It all seemed very simple on paper, but we needed a way to, to operationalize it. And those steps that have stars next to them, arrange data, code data, and identify themes, it was important that everyone on the team was doing it in, in the same way, that I wasn't arranging the data in one way, and another team member did it in a different way, and another team member did it in a different way. Same with coding the data, and same with identifying themes. We wanted to do it in a way that was standardized, because if we all did it in different ways, at the end, it would be hard to consolidate all of that analysis to really be able to present whatever findings we took from it. So this was a challenge because, as I said earlier, everybody had different levels of qualitative analysis experience, and we didn't have access 
to qualitative analysis tools. So we had to think of a way that we could do the analysis in a, in a standardized way using tools that we already had. So we had to kind of think through how we're gonna do this. How are we gonna do this in a way that, that makes sense for us? And we came up with three standardizations that we needed to have between us and the team members. And these were definitions. We all needed to talk about qualitative analysis in the same way. And that meant if I talked about coding data, or if I talked about content analysis, or if I talked about certain things, everyone had to interpret it in the same way, which is difficult because many times everybody is coming to qualitative analysis in different ways. And so we think about it in different ways. And so if I say something like coding data, I may think in my head, okay, that means one thing, but someone else may think it means a different thing. And so it meant coming together and making sure we all are defining qualitative analysis in the same way. The next thing was tools. That's where we needed to figure out what tool we're going to use to code this data. As I said, we didn't have any qualitative analysis software, nor did we have funds to be able to purchase that software. So we had to use tools that we already had, and that all of us already had. Luckily, we did all have Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. So we could quickly have that conversation and say, OK, we have Word, we have Excel. These are tools that we all can use in order to, to analyze this data. So we went with Excel and Word. And then we needed to talk about the process, which is, how are we going to use the tools in order to analyze the data? Because we all have Word and we all have Excel, but you can use those tools in different ways, right? There's many ways you can analyze data in Excel, and there's many ways you can analyze data in Word. But we needed to come up with a way that we were all doing it in the same way so that we could extract findings from all that data at the end. And so that was a challenge too is how, how will we use a tool that makes sense for this tool that makes sense for everybody going forward? So as I talked about, the first one was definitions. And what we wanted to define in the same way was the type of analysis we were doing, the coding type, the coding method, and the coding structure. Many times, what I found with qualitative analysis is that people do it in the way they're most comfortable doing it. And that might be whatever that might be for, for a certain person. It might be a content analysis using in vivo or whatever it may be. But it's important to understand there's many different ways to analyze qualitative data. And there's many different types, methods, and structures. So what we wanted to do was sit down with a list of the different types of analysis, types, methods, and structures, and really think what is the most appropriate use right now for this evaluation. Not just do the types we are most comfortable with, but really think what is the most suitable types for this evaluation. And so that's what we did. We sat down with a list of different analysis, different coding types, and different coding methods, and really thought, what do we want to use? What, what does this project really need? I'll talk about the definitions of these a little bit later, but I don't want to talk too much about that because I, I want to start going into how we did it. But what we wanted to do was, OK, so we have our types of analysis. We have content analysis, narrative analysis, discourse analysis, and there's other types as well. This is just a, a sample of them, but there's many different types. We know what are our coding types, deductive, inductive, or hybrid. Which one makes most sense for this project? 
And we have coding methods. We have descriptive, in vivo, process, structural, value, and many other ones. And again, I'll talk about the definitions of each of these shortly. But once we kind of sat down and thought about the definitions and thought which ones were most appropriate, we just put a little check by them and said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. So we can define the analysis for ever, anyone who wants to know. If our stakeholders wanna know, if a, you know, a coordinator or a boss wants to know, we can say, we're doing a content analysis using a hybrid coding that is descriptive and structural. And that's how we're defining our analysis going forward. So it's very clear in everyone's heads what we're doing. And we can just write it out. So we can say, this qualitative analysis is a content analysis, which will categorize interview data to classify and summarize the data. We will use hybrid coding. So it will have a set of established codes, deductive, and then add new codes, inductive, while we're working through the data. We will use structural coding. So we'll use who, what, where, when, and how to, guide, to guide the descriptive coding. And we'll use descriptive coding that summarizes ideas by using a single word or phrase that encapsulates the general idea of the data. And so this is what I mentioned when I talked about coding the data. We're gonna go through and start assigning codes to the data that will be hybrid coding and it'll be a content analysis. So we're just really trying to summarize the data through this coding structure. And so that's how we defined it. Um, and so, as I said, this was something that I covered, but in terms of tools, we did not have access to analysis software. We didn't have funds to purchase software. Some teams members did not have time and or desire to learn the software, which is big because a lot of times in evaluation projects, we don't have a lot of time. And so we don't have time to sit down and learn a new software for everybody. We just have to go. And so what were the tools we all have and know how to use? Microsoft Word and Excel. So that's what we went with. So now the process, right? How could we use Microsoft Word and Excel to efficiently and robustly code and analyze the data? So now is when I'm going to get into the fun part of the presentation, I think, where I can, I'm actually going to show how to use Word and Excel to really analyze our data, right, and extract those findings. So I'm going to switch over to a Word document and do kind of like a demonstration of how to do that. Before I switch over, though, I do want to just check in with everybody to see if there's any questions so far just about the background or any kind of definitions I'm using or anything I'm talking about. Is there any questions so far? And you can just write in the chat or, yeah, just write in the chat for now. I guess we can see. And if there's nothing, I'll wait about 10, oh, I see something. If there's, yeah, I'll wait about 10 more seconds. So far, so good. Great, thank you. And if I don't see anything in the chat, I'll just go on to the, to the Word document. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Hopefully everybody is seeing the Word document right now. Um, so how do we code qualitative data in Excel, in Word and Excel? So the first thing we want to do is open a Word document. Uh, and just open up a blank document. That's, that's the first thing we want to do. And the next thing we want to do is disable something called modern comments. Now, I don't know much about what modern comments are or what their purpose is, but they do not work with this method. So the first thing you have to do when you open up a Word document is disable modern comments. So how do we do that? We just go over, so we open up a Word document, go to File, Go to options. And there's this little checkbox here that says enable modern comments. Um, or whatever it may look like on, on your version of Word. But it should be something similar to this. 
And we want to make sure that this does not have a check on it, that there is no check here. Because if it is checked, then this will not work. So we want to make sure enable modern comments is not checked. If you have a different version of Word, then it might not even be there and we don't have to worry about it. But if you have a version of Word that has modern comments, we just have to make sure it's not there. If, if you don't see that there, then it's fine. You have a version of Word that does not have this and we're all good. So once we've done that, once we've disabled modern comments, we have to organize our data into Word. Um, the way I organized it was by question, and then the responses that the different respondents had under each question. So for example, in the, in the evaluation project I talked about, our first question was, do you feel the benefits resulting from sustainable certifications justify the financial investment needed to meet the requirements? Why or why not? And then below it, we put the answers from each respondent. So I have respondent one answer. I don't know if the benefits of sustainable certification are worth the financial investment, et cetera. Then I have the answer from the second respondent. Then I have the answer from the third respondent. So I'm just organizing it by question, then all the answers that I got to that question. If you want to organize it in a different way, that's fine. For example, you can organize it by respondent. So you can say respondent one, and then all of the responses from respondent one, respondent two, all the responses from respondent two. So you can organize it however way that you feel fits and whatever makes sense for the project. But for me, it made most sense to arrange the data by question and then all the different respondents underneath it. I want to talk a little bit about transcription because this is all text, right? The idea is we have all this qualitative data, but we want to get it into text. And that can be a, a challenge to do sometimes, especially if we don't want to buy some sort of transcription software. Again, when I was and pretty much all of the projects that I've worked on, we don't have the funds to be able to buy transcription software. And so we have to figure out a way to transcribe the data that is either free or very low in cost. So I do want to show really quick some ways that we can transcribe uh, qualitative data to get it into text um, that is free. One way is through Google Docs. Um, and hopefully you're seeing a Google Doc document right now. Google Docs is a free um, service. You just need a Google account and you can open a uh, Google Word. And through Google Word, we can actually transcribe um, verbal spoken into, into text. So if I open a, a Google Doc and I go to tools, there's something called voice typing. And if I click to speak, this will start to transcribe everything that I am saying. And so if you have an interview with somebody, you can actually just open Google Doc and just push the microphone and it will write everything that they're saying. And you don't need to go, you don't need to record it and go back and type it up yourself. You can do it, just open up a Google Doc, click the microphone and Google will do it for you and you're good to go. So that's a great service and that's free. All you need is a, is a Google Doc. And I'll uh, do that one more time. You just open up a Google Doc, you go to tools, voice typing, and a microphone pops up and you just click the microphone. Now, here's what I will say with this. Um, it has a lot of different languages. So these are all the different languages that you can transcribe in. Unfortunately, and I don't know why, but Mongolian is not one language you can transcribe in here. You can do English, you can do all these different ones, um, but Mongolian is not one that you can do. 
There is a different service though. If you need, if you want to do this, if you're doing an interview and people are speaking Mongolian and you want to do it in that, there's, and you have a smartphone, there's a live transcribe. And that is something you can download on your smartphone. And this does transcribe Mongolian. Um, and I'm going to see if there's a chat. Mongolian is a hard language. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I actually tested it in Mongolian. I will show it to you all. I have no idea if this did a good job transcribing. This was just a YouTube video of someone kind of explaining their day. And I put live transcribe. Um, can, actually, I'm curious, is this a good, does this make sense? Whatever was transcribed here, or is this not very good? Or let's thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't know. I don't know if this did, was a good job, but but if this is good, then live transcribe would work in the same way. Let's see if there's more. Not good. Okay. Well, I would say maybe try it out. Maybe um, give it a try and see. This might not be good, but give it a try. And that's um, live transcribe. Download it on your on your smartphone. If you have a smartphone, and it's free. And you and you can also just as someone is talking, push record, and it will transcribe the data. And if it doesn't work well, then and that that's not good. But if you have an interview in, in any of these languages, though, then Google Docs would work for that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the the Word doc. Okay, so once we have the interview data or focus group data or whatever it might be in written text, and if if yeah, if none of these transcribing things are working, um, then you might have to do it manually or pay, or pay for a software that does it. Um, but but the idea is to get into text. And so once we have it into text, and it's arranged, and here's my second question, same thing. So question two, what types of trainings can extractors provide to producers that would be most helpful to receive sustainable certification? And then here are all the responses to that question. We want to create a coding structure. So we want to create a hierarchy of codes based on the type of analysis that we're doing. And so I'm going to show many examples of how I'm using this coding hierarchy. And But the important thing is we want to define it. So it's defined for everyone on our team. So we're all coding everything in the same way. So here, our first code is the name of the survey respondent or some sort of thing that signifies who it is. So you can say respondent one, respondent two, respondent three, or you can say what their name is, but some, some way that we know which respondent it is. Our second code is the question number. So this is just the question that they're answering. That can, you can just say question one, question two, question three, question four. The third is the structure code. So this is something that's going to guide our coding. And we can say, is this, are they talking about a what? Are they talking about a when, a how, a who, a where, a why, or some sort of noteworthy example? And again, I'll show many examples of how I'm using this in a second. The next one is a descriptive code. So this will be a single word or phrase that encapsulates the general idea of what is being said. And then the last code is the phrase, the exact text, quote, or response from the respondent. So I'm just going to copy and paste exactly what they said. This is the coding structure that made the most sense for this project. But the idea is that any team can sit down and figure out which coding structure makes most sense for their analysis. So what does this look like as I'm coding my data? So this is what it's going to look like. I'm going to be leaving comments on my Word document. So I'm going to read the data. And as I'm reading, I'm just going to leave comments um, using the defined coding structure and separating each code by a semicolon. So 
For example, to leave a comment, I'm just going to highlight any text that I want. I'm going to right click. And I'm going to say new comments. And here I'm just going to write a new comment. So that, that's how I can leave a comment. And if our coding structure was what I was talking about, question, respondent, structure coding, descriptive coding text, then we can leave a comment that looks like this. I would say question, so my first code is question. So I have question two, semicolon, respondent one, semicolon, what, so this respondent is talking about something that has to do with the what of my question, semicolon, model farms. So the general idea of what they're talking about has to do with model farms, semicolon, and then the exact text of what they said. Something hands-on. I heard that some extractors have model farms where they show producers how to be more sustainable. That would be very helpful, but I've never been invited to a training like that. So that's my coding structure as it looks in, in a comment. I have my question, right? The first thing is the question number. Then I have my respondent, respondent one, so the respondent number. Then my structure coding, my descriptive coding, and my text. So the idea is I just go through all my, my um, written text here, and I just start leaving comments. So just anything that I find interesting or anything that's answering the question that I think would be interesting to pull out and present as a finding. So I'll highlight a text and I'll leave my comment over here. Question one, semicolon, respondent one, semicolon, what, semicolon, expensive certification, semicolon, and then their text. And so I just go through my whole document, leaving comments. And this is kind of what it looks like at the end. So I'll just be leaving comments on, on everything that I find interesting. For a quick analysis, this should take not much longer than just reading through the data one time. So as you're just reading the data, just leave comments. And it gets really quick once you get the hang of it. Um, it gets, it's once you get the idea of what you're doing, it goes really quick. If you have a more in-depth analysis, then you would have to maybe read the data, then reread it multiple times to ensure that nothing was missed. And so you'll read through it multiple times. But if it's a quick analysis, you can just read it through, the, through it one time and leave the comments. Okay, so now I have all the comments. What I'm gonna wanna do is copy all of the comments and paste them into an Excel. So how do I copy all the comments? What I'm gonna do is select the text in the first comment, then on my keyboard, hit Control Shift End, and it will highlight all the comments. Then Control C to copy all the comments. So how does this look when I do it? I'm gonna go to, a, go to the first comment, highlight it like this, and then on my keyboard, push control shift ends and all the comments will be highlighted like that. So now all the comments I have here are highlighted. Okay, so I'll do that one more time. So just I'll go to the first comment that I have, highlight it, and then push control shift ends and all my comments will be highlighted. Um, I just will note that Microsoft Word can be a little challenging sometimes when, when you want to highlight all the comments. Sometimes it doesn't want to do that for whatever reason. Um, if it does not select all the comments, try putting an additional comment on a later page, just like here, some random comment much later. And that might help. The other thing that might help is make sure that numlock, I'll just write that, make sure numlock is not on. Because um, if numlock is on, which is 
I don't even know why NumLock would ever be on, but sometimes it is. And so if NumLock on your keyboard is on, try turning it off and that might fix everything. Um, so I'm gonna highlight all my comments. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit Control C to copy them. Then I'm gonna open up an Excel document. Just open up a new Excel document. This one over. And uh, open up a blank workbook. So once I'm in my blank workbook, then I can select the first cell and just paste all my comments from the Word into the Excel. So now I have all my Word comments here in the Excel. And in the Excel is when I can start doing analysis. So I'll just, these were my example ones, I'll get rid of them. So I'll just do that one more time. So I'm in Word, I've copied all my comments through a control shift end. So everything is copied and I just go over to Excel, I right click and I paste all my comments into Excel. The problem now is that all the comments are in the same column. They're all in column A. And that's not very helpful because I have a lot of different information. I have my question number, my respondents, you know, my, and my, my coding and the exact text that, that the respondent said. So it's not very helpful if it's all in the same column. So the idea is I need to separate all of my codes into different columns so that I can start to analyze them. So the way that I do that is I highlight the first column. I go over here to data. And then I click on something called text to columns. When I click on text to columns, there's two options here, delimited and fixed width. I click on delimited, next. I select semicolon because semicolon is how I separated all my codes. I click next and then I click finish. And now all my codes are in separate columns. So here I have my column regarding my question, right? This is question one, question two, question three. Here's my column regarding what respondents, which respondent answered it. Here's my column regarding structural coding. Here's my column regarding my descriptive coding. And then here's the exact text that came from the document. And so here I can start looking at all the data that I have and really understanding what is it that I want to say about my data. Before I even go on, I do want to say I'm throwing a lot of information at you all. And if this is a method that you find interesting and want to use, I all the documentation um, will be made available. And so don't worry if, if you don't remember everything that I'm talking about right now. Um, I You can review this Word document later and it has all the steps in order to be able to do this. So once I have everything organized, what I like to do is create a new column called theme. And this is when I can start looking through all my different codes and really understand what themes are emerging from all the different codes that I have. And so what I can do is put a filter on the first row. And so I can just select the first row, go over to filter, and organize my descriptive codings, A to Z and just kind of see what I'm working with. 
and see if certain things are emerging. So I see environmental benefit, expensive certification, far away trainings. So these kind of things like negative, well, these seem like negative things, expensive certification, far away trainings. Those seem like things that aren't very good. These maybe could be barriers for farmers to get their certification. I see increased market price, increased revenue, increased revenue, increased sales. These seem like good things. These seem like things that could be encouraging the farmers to be able to get those certifications. So these theme, themes, themes like, um, I don't know, like benefits, benefit, benefits of the certification. So I can start going through and just kind of see what themes are emerging, that we have some barriers, we have some benefits, and just really understanding what I want to say about the data. Once I kind of start going through and start organizing my themes, I can start constructing a narrative. So this is kind of what, so this is all in the document as well, to paste and organize in Excel. I don't know how we don't do all that. So this is where we are. So we're going to add our column of themes and really see what themes are emerging. So we could see themes such as increased sales, market prices, and revenue. We have travel barriers. We have other certification benefits. And these are kind of new codes that we can place on, on what we're seeing in our data to really be able to extract findings and understand how we want to present them to whatever stakeholders that we're going to present them to. So we're going to identify emerging narratives that come through the data. As we read through the comments and seeing emerging themes, we can begin to extract summaries. So this is an example summary that we could have extracted from that Excel document with all the, the different codes and themes that we were seeing. Small scale farmers expressed mixed opinions about sustainable certification. Some saw it as a valuable investment that could bring financial benefits and improve the reputation of their farming industry. Others had concern about the high cost and difficulty of traveling to necessary training sessions, which are often felt, which are often held far away. This sentiment was summarized by one farmer who said, I tried contacting the oil extractor about receiving training last month, and they told me I had to go to a training they were holding that was far away and I couldn't go. They need to be more accommodating. Some farmers suggested alternative methods of learning about sustainable practices necessary to receive the certification, such as model farms or phone apps. Overall, the farmers recognized the importance of sustainable certification for the environmental benefits and increased access to market, but also expressed a need for more accessible and convenient training options. So this summary here was just taken from the codes that I had in the Excel document. And it's a way to summarize and kind of present what, what they're saying um, to really, yeah, to summarize all that, all the data that we have and present it in a clear, concise way so that anyone can kind of understand what the, what the takeaways are. One thing I just do want to point out, as we're going through our data, as we're going through this Excel sheet that we have, it's important not to just look at how many times something is being said. It's important to not just think about frequency. Um, because when we only think about how many times something is being said, we're kind of silencing the voices of, of those who might be in a disagreement or might, who might feel in a different way. And it's important not to completely silence, silence those voices when, when we're extracting findings. So I just want to present this quote that I think summarizes that sentiment in that richness of data is derived from a detailed description, not just the number of times something is stated. Frequency is central to the analysis, but is often the infrequent gem that puts other data into perspective that becomes central key to understanding the data and for de developing the model. It is the implicit that is interesting. So I think that just summarizes that 
we don't always just want to present findings based off what people are saying the most. We also want to make sure we're including voices of, of people who might have a disagreeing or a different way of thinking about things as well. And one last thing that I want to show is this um, analysis definitions template. And so when we, when I was talking earlier about that list of different analysis types and coding types and methods, um, this is just a more complete list that has the definition of each of each thing that I was talking about. So like the content analysis is the process of categorizing data um, to summarize and tabulate the data. Narrative analysis is an analyzing stories in the way in which they are told, unpacking the ways in which people deal with, cope with, and sense uh, make sense of their reality. Um, so they talk more about how something is said. And so I just wanted to present this too, um, and this is, will be on the documentation that will be made available, that we can see um, all the different types of analysis that we could use, all the different coding types and methods, so we can really go through this list and consider what's the most appropriate for the analysis that we're doing. So that was a lot of information. Um, I hope that it was useful and maybe even if the whole method isn't something that you could that you would want to apply, maybe at least some parts of the method could be applicable in, in certain projects that you're working on. So I want to pause there. I see there's something in the chats. I don't know if it's a question or. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to see if there's any questions that anyone have about these about this method or anything that didn't really make sense, anything that you'd like to know more about. Um, so I'll just pause there for any questions that, that there may be. I have questions, Seth. Um, thanks very much for a very practical uh, illustration of using the word and Excel. Um, I was wondering that before we come to the the thematic analysis, you have this description, right? Uh, so do you come up with that yourself in advance? Uh, because some keywords are there, right? So do you identify those keywords yourself? Yeah, and can you just explain in, in what part? So which, which keywords? Yeah, maybe could you uh, share your screen again? Yes. So is it at the, uh, we're talking about the end, like this part? In, in Excel. So you, Excel, um, uh, in each column now, uh, we have the data. Yes. So for, so. Yeah, descriptive coding. I, I came up, yes. So that would be me yeah. coming up with those. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The structural codes were just, those are set. And so that's just, a what, a who, a why, how, or an example. And so those are set, uh, set of codes that I am just applying to every thing. Descriptive mm -hmm. codes I'm coming up with. And so I'll just look at the text and I'll think of either a word or a small phrase that summarizes the text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The next question. The next question is, so uh, in the very uh, last um, section, you uh, combine everything and then you do the conclusion part, right? So um, do you write it uh, yourself? Like uh, you based on all the coding and then you summarize all together. Do you do that? Yes, yeah. So that's just a matter of going through the codes and the themes and seeing what's emerging. And, uh, you know, again, it'll be a little bit about frequency. So we'll see what people are saying a lot of, um, not, not completely disregarding, you know, people who are in the minority of certain opinions, but it is seeing what people are saying a lot of and bringing those to, to kind of be able to summarize in a concise way what the thoughts and opinions of all the stakeholders were. 
And that can be done in the way that I showed in a paragraph. Um, you know, if it's in a longer report, then that's fine as well. If it's, you know, some sort of visualization, then that's okay as well. Um, there's many different ways to present what that summary is. But, um, but in, yeah, what I put was just a paragraph. And that was just something that emerged from looking through the data and seeing what kind of ideas were, were kind of emerging from that. I want to ask one more, but if, let's see if others also would like to ask. Well, if not, uh, so the last quotation you shared is, um, to me, it's a um, very nice way that they say, okay, we don't have to um, always look at the, the frequency of the teams that are arising, right? So usually uh, the way I was taught is, um, especially in qualitative analysis, um, and how many times that team is coming up so that's the significant um that that's the judgment i should then i make that that would become to my conclusion but the quotations say it's not necessarily that thing but also uh, we see the nuance right so um you're just a very practical um tip what would be like how many times one thematic one thematic theme is uh, coming out like three times or four times or so what's the balance <laughs> so uh, what i would say is that a lot of this has to do with the the analyst right and the analyst judgment um because just counting up i like the in short, there is no correct number. And just counting up is not always going to be the most effective way to present the data because sometimes, and I'm just, I'm remembering um, in a mixed method analysis that I, that I was doing, the, um, we found that people who, and it was, and it was a uh, competition people were a part of. And so it was, people were submitting applications to receive money. And some people thought that the judging process was very biased against um, people in certain um, indigenous communities. They thought it was very biased against them. And because of that, they were very negative on the competition. They thought it was a very bad competition. They were in the minority. Not many people thought that the, the judging process was biased. There were not many people who thought that. But those who did think that really didn't like the competition, right? And so it wasn't uh, counting up how many people thought it was biased, which is a very small number. It was seeing the magnitude of that opinion. So that that there wasn't a lot that had a, that opinion, but those that had an opinion, that opinion, it was very, um, it influenced them a lot in their in their opinion of the competition. And so if that, so what I want to say with that is sometimes it's not how many times someone is saying something, it's the magnitude of what they're saying. It's how it's it's how much what they're saying actually influences their opinion about things. Um, if that makes, so that, that's what I think I wanted to say with that quotation is that mm -hmm. frequency is important. We wanna make sure that we're telling what many people feel, but we also want to understand the magnitude of those opinions. And maybe a small amount of people have a certain opinion, but that opinion is big. That opinion really influences them. In, in how they think about the world or how they think about our evaluation questions. Very last one. So uh, only one person, like only one respondent or key informant said very significant thing. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that as a finding worth putting in the report? Or how would you deal with that? I, again, I, I don't, maybe. Right, and it's hard to say if, if one out of two people or one out of a hundred people, or you know, it depends on how many people there are in the whole sample. Um, 
but if if the analyst feels it's very important, then then it's okay. I would think it would be okay. Now, you would have to balance that too with just all all the other things that people are saying, and and I think you would always have to justify why you think it's so important to present just one person saying something. Um, as long as you can justify it, then that's okay. But if it's if it's something that you feel like would be a hard time explaining why you think it's why you think it's so important, then, then no. I think the example that I had where we had quantitative data to match with the qualitative data, right, about the bias in the competition, that's a way we could justify why we felt it was important to highlight the small number of people that found bias, because then we could match that with the quantitative data and say, look, not many people said it, but it was very influential in how they thought about the competition. And so if you have that kind of quantitative data to, to match with the um, qualitative data, then I, then I think it would be easier to justify why, why to include just one person saying something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? I'm, all, I'm also curious, um, I know we're running out of time here. I'm just curious, you could write in the chat or you can say, does this method, just out of curiosity for me too, does this method seem like something that would be helpful? Um, yes or no, or maybe. Um, I'm just kind of curious what people's impressions are. Is this something that you feel could be beneficial to, to a project that you are on or, or will be on? Any, any thoughts about that? Okay. I find it very helpful is that it okay. can, uh, interviewing and also focus group discussions, we collect like too much data, too much long narratives, and it is very difficult to analyze those long narrative data and like sum up and put it in your report. So what you just uh, showed us was very really helpful. And I, I, I also think that we, we can maybe uh, code our um, answers uh, by our like report sections. And yeah, maybe if we have any kind of like, if, if, if the report includes like, uh, for example, under the dam, you, you just put the barriers and the benefits. So we can use those things as our fourth subsections, which, uh, which is great that we can find the data directly from our uh, raw data file. Otherwise, like it is very difficult to read all the data again and again. I think it's great. Really yeah, and I, I see a comment too about the um, about the transcription application. I yeah, it's, um, I I didn't know. I th I would say try it out though, you know, or um, and see if it works in in other ways. I don't know, but but it, because that it, it always is a difficult process of like taking that qualitative data and getting it into text. That's always like a right, okay. I'm joking. Okay. It was, uh, it's always a frustrating process. And so, um, and so, yeah, I'm always trying to look for ways that, 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 that process could be less frustrating. So if it's, uh, yeah, try, try the app though and, and see if it works, maybe it'll work better. But if, if there's no more questions, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really enjoyed presenting this to you all. And um, I don't know, Dennis after me also has some, some great tools in, uh, in Excel, he'll, he'll continue showing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Before, before we move our next session, um, let us take a photo. <laughs> Everyone, please open your camera. <laughs> So we still will take a photo. 
Okay, I'll I'll take a picture on three. One, two, and, and, and three. Okay. Thank you. Sweet. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So helpful. Especially the column. <laughs> How you could really uh, transform yeah. all, everything into many of the columns and it's for me it's it's also like it's very helpful that um i usually try to code or like bring, um, my answers into different sections etc and i always wonder what is the best way or the best international practice to do this kind of analysis for the common data because i also tried to use some other programs like the, the do's and then you receive but they were really like i couldn't find if they are helpful or not like since like comparing to quantitative data analysis like the analysis and qualitative data is like um it has too much me uh, like mechanic mechanical task job you have to do you know, like code and <laughs> Uh, column or sections you have to do uh, like it takes time but in the end yeah it's it's really helpful that this is the way that uh, other people do also <laughs> thank you and i'll just say when I, if people want to add me on linkedin i'll put my contact in the chat and if you have any if you're using this method and something isn't going right or you need some troubleshooting feel free to message me and i can provide any guidance that i can so i'll put my linkedin in the chat if anyone wants to add me So before moving to our next session, let's take a five minute break. Yeah, you can have a drink. I think it's really no. And let's meet back after five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, so now is our last session of our three days of the training and um, we have our speaker, Dennis Hood, who will present us also one very practical tool about data visualization. So please welcome our speaker, Mr. Dennis Hood, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm excited to have a chance to chat with everybody. Thank you for staying up into the evening. I appreciate you sticking with me through the end here. So I'm excited to be with you for the next hour. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Dennis. I live in uh, right outside of Washington, D.C. here in the U.S., uh, I'm actually about uh, 15 to 20 minutes away from American University's campus, <laughs> so I, I'm close at hand there. Uh, I am uh, I am the founder of a small boutique consulting company called Equa Solutions. I started that company in 2009 during my first grad school, and so it's going on go about 14 years of operations, and uh, we do some consulting we do a lot of proposal management for a lot of small and medium-sized clients uh, throughout the U.S. and abroad. Uh, but more excitingly, probably for this audience, uh, in the last few years, we've been getting into some evaluation work as well, mixed methods and qualitative approach. And I've been really honored and fortunate to work with a lot of exciting organizations that do youth education, healthcare, Currently, I'm helping uh, an organization to do uh, some assessment of conservation, agriculture, and other topics. So uh, I get really excited about, <laughs> about my, my clients and what they're doing. So all this is to say is, though, though I'm really help focused on helping these clients. And a, a lot of these clients are in situations that I'm sure a lot of you are in. They've got limited resources. They've got, you know, their, their budget might be small. They have limited time. And so I'm really focused on helping identify practical solutions to help enhance long-term vision. And I'm really drawn to stories. You know, I, data visualization is all about presenting stories. You know, the clients I work with, and I'm sure the organizations that all of you work for and with all have really unique missions. And whether that's a unique historical context that they're working in or, some really interesting challenge that they're trying to overcome or a novel approach to what they're doing. I'm nerdy about helping companies communicate their story and what they're doing. And I think data visualization is an important part of that. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Make sure it actually works. All right, can you see my screen? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly go over just a quick uh, agenda for what I'll have for you in the next uh, few minutes here. Just a, a brief introduction to what we're doing, uh, and then I'll go over some of the types of visualizations that I think are helpful in Excel. Uh, and then I'll go over some uh, professional tips to help take your visualizations in Excel to that next level. I want to touch on some accessibility ideas to make sure that the visualizations that you produce uh, are key, are being accessible to as wide a population as possible. Uh, I've got some helpful resources to share with everybody. And then just like Seth did earlier, I'm going to move on to a demonstration in Microsoft Excel as well. So I will just go ahead and dive right in here. So just a little introduction as to what, what I want to go over in the next few minutes here. Um, you know, so many of you are focused on gathering, analyzing, and reporting your data to a wide range of audiences, whether that's evaluation stakeholder, funders, internal chains of command. So I really want this presentation to be use focused and helpful to give you some ideas to help share your organization's unique stories and call out your unique accomplishments, challenges, and approaches. Uh, Microsoft Excel. Uh, is a, a relatively accessible tool to quickly and cheaply produce data visualizations. So this presentation is going to provide a basic overview of some straightforward graphs, charts, and tools 
that you can fairly quickly put together and incorporate into your evaluation reports or other documents. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, then I'm going to share some helpful tools to help take your visualizations to that next level. You know, Microsoft Excel turns out some useful default options, but there are some options where if you ingest just a couple minutes, you can really take them to the next level. So I do want to emphasize that this is a workshop for, you know, relative newcomers and beginners to Excel and, and to data visualization. If you have expertise in R or Tableau or some more, you know, complex data visualization techniques, I applaud you and uh, I could probably learn from you. Uh, but, the, you know, this is more meant more of as a, a beginner to, to uh, a beginner's tool to help you choose which data visualizations to use and then how to produce them. So just, just a quick disclaimer there before we, we dive in. So as we start moving in here, before we dive in too far, I just want to emphasize, first of all, that it's critical for all of you to be mindful of your data when you select what visualization you want to use. You know, I'll go over a few different types of data visualizations that you can easily make in Excel here, but you know, ultimately it's up to you to decide what type of data do you have, how much data do you have, what's the best way to tell your story. So, you know, just keep that in mind as we dive in here. So, but as our first slide here shows, you know, the, the most basic visualization, I think, is a pie chart. It's it, sometimes they can be appropriate and helpful, particularly if you have a relatively small amount of data that you want to quickly present. So when you want to present data that comprise the parts of a whole, a pie chart can be helpful. That is when you have different pieces of data that when you add them together, contribute to a total. So let's, let's take an example of say, uh, a, this, the population of a city, say that's 100,000. You could present, with, with a pie chart, you could present different demographic subsets of that population, such as age groups, for example. You know, you could have, you know, different slices of your pie you know, one slice for the everybody that's uh, zero to 17 years of age, 18 to 39, uh, 40 to 59, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all those together would equal your, your total. Some other examples of things where you could have sub items that comprise a total would be uh, an organization's budget. Uh, you know, what, what are the line items that go into that budget? Uh, the sources of a company's sales. There are lots of options, but just be mindful about what your data is and how many categories it includes. I've added a little disclaimer on this slide that uh, I think pie charts should try to be used somewhat sparingly. If you have too many categories of data, you could end up with too many slices of pie. And just like when you're eating your dessert, you don't want to have too many slices of pie because you're just going to end up sick and it's not going to end up making too much sense. The purpose of data visualization is to tell your story quickly. And if you have more than about four or five categories of something, by, at that point, your pie has too many slices and people aren't going to be able to really tell what story you're trying to make. But this is a, a basic uh, start. <laughs> but it, in other cases, I would encourage you to consider some other options, which we can go over in a second here. Bar charts, I think, are, you know, pie charts, big brother, helpful big brother. They're a little bit of a more of a sophisticated way of displaying categorical data, with, and they allow you to take the next step beyond pie charts and show larger quantities of data. These can generally be presented either horizontally or vertically. And the specific method you choose is generally up to the type of data you want to visualize. There are a few things in mind when you decide if your data would lend itself to being in a bar in a bar chart. Uh, first, you, the data should fit into discrete categories. For example, you could look at the number of students enrolled in different number in different programs at a school, uh, the number of patients who take specific medication, quantities of different types of crime in a particular location of a city. Options are pretty endless here. 
But it's important to point out that generally these categories are independent from one another. Uh, I'd also like to note that a bar chart can be a, a visually powerful way to display situations where you have more categories of data than you would for a pie chart. So if you have, say, seven to 10 categories of data, your message is going to be much more clearly conveyed in a bar chart where you can convey those in, that information a little bit more separately than you would in a pie chart. Now, it's important to think about whether or not you want to use a vertical or a horizontal bar chart, both of which can be produced very easily in Microsoft Excel. Horizontal bar charts are best for nominal data. That is, they're used to categorize particular attributes that are being measured. For example, the number of patients with specific conditions, preferences for different flavors of candy, responses on a survey, so on and so on and so on. Vertical data is better for ordinal data. That is, there's a progression. It goes from smallest to largest or oldest or, or newest to oldest. And in that case, you go generally left to right. So example, ages, incomes, heights. Incomes could go from less smallest income to larger income, and you would go left to right. And so on your x-axis, you would have your categories, and then the quantities would be your vertical frequencies. There are other types of bar charts as well that uh, I would just make a quick note of. I, I'm not going to do demonstrations of those, but there are some called stacked or clustered bar charts. Uh, you know, there are some helpful resources out there that make you know, you present your data a little bit more sophisticated ways. But you know, for now, I just want to keep it relatively simple with you know horizontal and vertical charts, and and I will show some examples of a, of a horizontal chart in a little bit here as well. Another type of helpful visualization that you can produce in Excel, which is a little bit more complicated than Excel, is a histogram, which appears very visually similar to a vertical bar chart in that they show the distribution of data in a vertical fashion with bars or lines. But there are some important distinctions between histograms and bar charts. Bar charts depict categorical data, and there's usually a space between the bars that shows you know, one category here, another category here. Histograms depict quantitative data, and there's no space between those bars. They're, they, it's usually help, more helpful when you have a larger data set and you want to understand the frequency or densities of values within certain ranges. You can use them to visualize the distribution of continuous variables. Uh, uh, I, you, and then that'll help you identify outliers, compare distributions, and understand how that data is spread out. There's a lot of situations where you could use these. Again, distribution of age groups in a population, distributions of test scores, product ratings, website traffic, and many others. Honestly, I'm not a histogram expert. I'm, you know, I, I'm more of a qualitative person. And so, you know, histograms start to bordering on a little bit more, more quantitative type data. You know, I just wanted to touch base on these. I'm sure a lot of you have more uh, statistical and quantitative backgrounds than I do, and you're all smarter than me. So I, I will definitely show you uh, when a histogram can be used uh, and how to how to use it in a little bit when we get into the demonstration. Uh, line charts are, are, very, are very helpful as well. They can show trends or changes over time. The time component is the critical part for these types of graphs. They can be useful to show types of trends for multi, multiple variables on the same charts. There are lots of examples of when line charts can be useful. Uh, for example, you could show test scores, mortality rates, temperatures, or other variables from one unit of time, from one month to another, from one year to another, whatever unit you're looking at. And then you could break that down even further, which is when things start to get even more exciting. So for example, the, the example of test scores, you could show one line that represents the test scores of one school in a particular area, and another line that shows the same test scores for a different school in that same area over a period of time. And that can allow you to quickly display differences in performance and then make quick comparisons and contrasts. Uh, oh, I just saw that there's a chat. Oh, yes, there is also a uh, scatter plots are also helpful. Uh, I appreciate the question. Let's see, did I have a, a did I have a, a note on scatter plots? Yes, scatter plots are also very helpful. 
especially when you want to compare the relationship between two different variables. For example, the relationship between uh, between uh, income and and uh, mortality rates or something like that. And in fact, I'll have a demonstration in a little bit on how to put together a scatter plot. That's helpful when you have two two different variables. That's a, a great question. So I'll actually show you in a little bit on how to do a scatter plot. So I do want to quickly make a note on qualitative data and how to visualize that. You know, Seth provided such a helpful demonstration earlier on how he analyzes his information. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but it's important to note that Excel can be used to, to analyze and visualize qualitative data, not just quantitative data. So as Seth showed, the first step is to enter and code your qualitative data into Excel. That's a whole separate topic. I'm not going to go into. I mean, I uh, I, say, I think Seth covered that really well earlier. He's much better at that than I am. So once you have your qualitative data entered, there are some charts that you can produce. You know, Excel isn't the best for qualitative data visualization, but there are some things you can do. Um, you can make a frequency table that shows the quantity of times that certain words, themes, codes, or whatever units are mentioned. And then you, from, from a frequency table, you could use other more traditional charts that we've talked about, bar charts, line charts, depending on whatever your data says. Now, I know set, you know, we had the discussion earlier in the in the session that you know frequency is not the only thing to think about in qualitative data, but you know, it, it, frequency is one one item that is mentioned quite a bit in qualitative data analysis. So it could be one of several helpful tools in your toolkit when you're thinking about your reporting. In the past, we, when I've used Excel for data visualization, I've had some success developing uh, thematic maps or heat maps of qualitative, qualitative data. And that's something that you might think about using in your future reporting. So in this situation, you would build a table of the frequency of your qualitative data, and then you would literally color code it to graphically show topics that are mentioned more than others. So for example, sh shades of red could be topics that are mentioned less times, or light greens and dark greens could show words or phrases that get mentioned more. And so then, you know, when you have this table, you can immediately see, like, for example, on this table here, you can see, oh, uh, this dark green, that must be something that's mentioned quite uh, quite often, or you know, light reds or, or dark reds are mentioned fewer. So that helps you think about themes It's not and get you going to the next level of your analysis. It's not your only tool by any means, but at least it helps you get thinking. There are other tools that you can use, timelines, Gantt charts, and many others. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on those, but I just wanted to make sure you were aware of the possibilities and uh, to get you thinking for those of you who are engaged in qualitative evaluation and other types of research. So what I get excited about are some of these pro tips for cleaning up your data in Excel. There are several things you can do to help take your visualizations to the next level and make you, your stories come out in a more powerful way. First. I think the first step is just cleaning up your data in Excel. If you order your data, uh, you have lots of options. You know, you can go from you can do alphabetical A to Z. Uh, you can do smallest to largest, largest to smallest. Lots of options to bring order to the chaos of your of your data. Uh, sometimes think about the grid lines in your charts. If you have lots and lots of grid lines. Sometimes that creates a, a visual noise that detracts from your audience's ability to get to the point of your message. So, you know, sometimes grid lines can be helpful to be able to point out scales, but, you know, you don't always have to use them in every situation. I would also be make a note about being cognizant of late legends and labels, especially if you're showing multiple labels. And we can get into that a little bit in the demonstration in a bit. Um, Labeling data is critical and uh, adding quantities to categories in a bar chart, showing percentages when it's not clear, things like that can be helpful tools to help take your data to the next level. Uh, I've, I've got a comment in here about fonts and colors. This is something that maybe people don't always think about when taking their data to the next level. The data is there to help tell your story, your organization's story, your program story. 
there are ways that you can use color to tell that story and to make your audience understand what you're trying to convey. For example, if you want to cast attention to a specific category in a bar chart, you could make that bar uh, a, a, a darker shade of whatever color you're using or even a different color altogether so that when the audience takes a look at that bar chart and you know, all the charts are, are all the, the, the bars are one color, but one is a different color, it'll draw their attention to that one right away first. You can use gradients and different shading to show relationships between categories and but just different ways for you to start getting creative to show to show your story. It's it, you know it, this is your data and your story that you're trying to show here. Fonts are also important. Microsoft Excel tends to have its default fonts these days. It tends to be Calibri, which is fine. I'm not saying it's not a bad font, but you don't have to use your their default fonts. In two or three clicks. You can use other fonts to uh, adjust whatever the font for whatever need you have. In many situations, you won't have a lot of space for your charts. Sometimes you have just a small amount of space in a in a report or a, or a website, uh, and visualizations take up a lot of space, and you have to be efficient with them in many cases. So, in those cases, you consider maybe using more of a a condensed font. Oops, I'm not sure why my why am I PowerPoint string that? Sorry about that. Uh, but as I was saying, you can use a condensed font in many situations. Uh, condensed fonts tend to be narrower, smaller, and you know they convey the same amount of information, but they just take up less space. I would also be mindful about using serif fonts versus sans serif fonts. So when I say a, a serif font, a serif is the little foot or tail that you sometimes see on, on, a, on a font. Like Times New Roman has the little, the little ticks at the end of a lot of letters. That's a serif. Sometimes a sans serif font is a little cleaner and tends to uh, make it easier on the eyes. But you know sometimes your organization needs to use a serif font. Just be mindful of whatever it is you're trying to do. And I would also make a point on branding. Your organization that you work for or that, that you're trying to, to consult for probably has a very specific appearance for its visualizations. You can, you can very quickly adjust your charts to accommodate that branding and enhance that organization's message. You know, if your colors are purple, yellow, and green, then you can very quickly make your, bar, your bars and lines purple, yellow, and green, or whatever colors it is. You know, the point here is Excel does a great job of giving you the basics, but feel free to go to the next level. Uh, I also think that figure titles are helpful and something that we don't always think about. Figure titles allow you to quickly communicate even more and enhance the message of your charts. And I provide an example here of how I usually like to do a figure title. I usually number my figure, all my, my the figures, my data visualization figures, figure X, one, two, three, and then usually a full sentence title after that uh, with a period at the end that quickly, it, it doesn't have to be a long sentence, it could be eight, nine words, but to something that quickly conveys what you're trying to say in that, in that data visualization as well. So here's an example of taking uh, a chart from an Excel default option to something that is a little bit more useful. In this situation, I have totally made up data about a hypothetical hospital and the composition of its staff, nurses, social workers, doctors, maintenance workers, et cetera. Total hypothetical, not real data. But and I'll, so on the left here, this is the default option that Excel turned out for me in a situation. It's fine. It conveys the information. It's there, but it takes a little bit to kind of get through. You have to, you know, you're, I'm not sure what you're trying to say, but the information is there and it is displayed. It just doesn't say much of a story. With about 30 seconds of tweaks, maybe a minute of tweaks, we can definitely turn a default option into a data visualization that tells a story. We reduce the noise of the chart by taking off the grid lines. We turned it from a vertical chart into a horizontal chart. We, we added uh, some, some labels for our categories to make the quantities clear. We ordered the data. 
We branded the colors to that align with my my company's colors. My company's colors are lime green and dark blue, and so we we made that lime green to make it look like something that my company would produce. Uh, we used a condensed font here to save space. The uh, and then uh, we added a little bit more of an informative title to help the audience quickly understand the purpose. Uh, we're trying to show that nurses are the 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 largest quantity of staff members here. And so we, we convey that quickly by making the color a little bit darker to cast the eye quickly to that top bar. So it took about 45 seconds to make these tweaks. And it's something that anybody can do really quickly in Excel to make their story pop even more. So I wanna make a few points about accessibility. Accessibility is something that you should be mindful about in your data visualization, and Excel has a few options to help you with this. It's important to be considerate of individuals who may have low vision or color blindness, for example. In those situations, it's helpful to choose colors in Microsoft Excel that have higher levels of contrast. So blue and orange, for example, uh, have a lot more contrast than blue and purple. In those situations, it's easier to tell the difference between what the two lines or bars would be. So a lot of people have color blindness in the world, and red and green tends to be the most common form of color blindness. So, you know, red and green are a good contrast, but unfortunately, red and green are also the most common form of color blindness. So these are just a few things to be considerate of, especially if you know if your population has uh, some individuals with colorblindness. In Microsoft Excel, there's also a function called alt text. I'm sure many of you have heard of this or used it in the past. Alt text is basically a brief written description of your chart or image that can then be read on screen by, uh, by screen reading software for individuals who may be visually impaired. It's fairly easy in Excel, uh, and I can show you this if you want to, uh, during our demonstration, but uh, we have a, under the Format tab, there's literally a button called Alt Text. And from there, you can write a, a one or two sentence description of whatever chart it is that you've made. And this is this just basically makes your visual more accessible to people with uh, certain types of of uh, visual disabilities and helps make expand your audience, which is helpful to be inclusive to, and accessible in, in this in this age. So, just some things to be th uh, to be thinking about. A few helpful resources I wanted to share here, and and, uh, and I will be ha happy to share this uh, this presentation with you all later on, so you can keep these. Um, these are just some blogs and websites that I refer to often when I'm looking for additional tips on, on making my visuals a little bit stronger. Uh, one of my one of the, the best data visualization experts out there is a, a, a Dr. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Evergreen. She has a blog that is extremely helpful, and uh, I'm always happy to refer to people who are smarter than me. Um, American University has some other data visualization uh, uh, webinars as well. And then I've also provided on here a, a color contrast checker. There are a lot of these online, but this is one that I've used in the past where you can literally enter in the, 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 the CMYK or the RGB of your two colors to make sure that you have good contrast in whatever colors you're using. And there are a lot of others that you can Google as well. In the past, when I presented this workshop, uh, I've also included Seth Tucker's information uh, as a helpful uh, resource as well. But since he was already on here, uh, you know, you've already benefited from his, his uh, expertise as well. So, uh, so now I will go ahead and move on to the the, the fun part of the de of the demonstration here. Move on to the actual Excel sheet here. Let me grab my notes here. When I when we move over to the Excel, uh, I what I'm going to do is I will make. I'm going to make one of each of these types of data visualizations that we went over. Uh, and then I'll take one or two of those charts and it, apply some of those pro tips that we went over to show how you can make your charts tell their stories in a little bit more of a powerful way. So I will move on here. And if at any point anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chats. I, I, I know it, I'm 
spewing a lot of information out. So I'm happy to uh, slow down at any point or repeat anything, especially as we go into the Excel here. So, so as we get into the Excel here, um, I'm assuming that all of you are able to actually enter the data it, itself. I'm not going to go over how to actually enter your data. Uh, oh, you know, good comment on pivot tables. Pivot tables are a little bit uh, are are not something that uh, I'm covering here. Those are a really helpful tool, and I can maybe try to share some resources later on for those. Uh, I'm not a pivot tool expert. I'm looking more at uh, to more traditional types of charts here, but I think pivot tools are a are a powerful tool as well. You know, we're, we're I'm showing a little bit more of the uh, the, the the more beginner level uh, types of charts, but I think pivot tools are are very helpful. I apologize, but uh, I haven't prepared a demonstration on a pivot table here. Unfortunately, I'd have to try to find some sort of uh, specific data for that, but um, I can definitely share some resources on that later on to. <laughs> To, to that particular chart. So this, I, I've got several tabs at the, the, the bottom here that show the different types of charts we'll go over. The first one is we'll go over. We'll start with the the pie chart. Uh, the data we're looking at here is uh, right now. I'm currently working on a on a, a qualitative project that is looking at uh, different types of farms in the U.S. state of Louisiana. And we're trying to be mindful of uh, the fact that a lot of farms are owned by different uh, ethnic groups or different uh, minority groups here in the US. And so I put together a list of uh, the different types of farms and uh, the, the, um, the ownership of those farms by, by different minority groups here in the US. We've got uh, Hispanic owned, uh, American Indian owned. Oh. Are you showing any Excel? Can you see the Excel that I have popped up here? Uh, no, we can see the PPT, PowerPoint, sir. Oh, the PowerPoint is still showing? OK. Uh, you know what? Let me pull it. I apologize. I've got the Excel pulled up here. Let me let me stop my screen share for a moment and uh, and then try to pull it back up. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, I'm trying again. There we go. Now we can see the Excel file. Now we can. See, okay, that would have made no sense at all if I would have gone on for 20 minutes <laughs> doing these cells. Thank you, I appreciate it. So, like I was saying, here's our first. We've got several tabs here. Uh, the the first tab here uh, is uh, to show our pie chart. This is the number of uh, farms in Louisiana that are owned by different minority groups uh, in the U.S. and so I, as I'll show here in a moment, it, 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 all of these charts are produced in a very easy, straightforward way. That's why Microsoft Excel is so accessible. We literally select our data. And the important part here is to go to insert. And then here we have our, our charts option right here. It, it presents several uh, ma uh, main options for types of charts. But uh, what I like to really go, do is go to this little box for recommended charts and then go into all charts. This gives you every chart that you could uh, possibly make. And in this case, I like to, uh, we're doing a, a pie chart. So it's, it's it's literally as easy as clicking pie and then clicking OK. And just like that, we have our pie chart. And you know, I'm not going to go, go into the pro tools, the pro tips quite yet. I'll go through and make our charts first before we go back and uh, clean them up but you know excel has you know produced a, its default colors in this case you know, i don't know that i would have cho chosen this particular set of colors right away but uh, uh it's you know it's helpful it shows that uh, you know this is we've got the the biggest slice of our pie is this uh, the the black owned farms uh, in louisiana so you know it presents the data and uh, it's produced our chart fairly quickly so uh, and then if any of you are curious on any of the data sources, I do list the data sources down here if, you, if you're ever curious to go back and uh, try yourself as well. Uh, so we'll go on to the bar chart. Uh, the bar, 
this is a situation from a, uh, some research that was done uh, earlier on uh, maternal mortality rates in as of twenty uh, as of twenty twenty. Oh, that should say twenty twenty. In East and Southeast Asia, so mater uh, maternal mortality rates here being defined as the rate of uh, 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 the number of de uh, maternal deaths per one hundred thousand live births uh, per country. Uh, just kind of an international development uh, focused uh, data set here. So again, producing this chart is a simple, straightforward step. It's a matter of, of selecting our data, going up to insert, clicking our little box here to, uh, to uh, choose, and then going to all charts. And then right here, we have our bar chart, and it gives us lots of different options for our bar chart. And we're just going to go with a, with a standard bar chart here. And so that has produced right away our bar chart that shows there are different categories. And we'll come back to this one in a little bit and do some helpful ways to maybe clean this up to tell a story a little bit, uh, a little bit more of a compelling way, but uh, that at least shows, shows how to produce one of those. So I want to do a histogram uh, for, for all of you to show how to produce one of these. Like I said, I'm not a histogram expert by any means, like, you know, histogram gets into a little bit more of the statistical, uh, the, st the statistical uh, analysis, and you know, uh, but um, but I will show how to produce one of these. Histograms are produced in a slightly different way than other charts in Excel, and a lot of you may know this already. But uh, but to do that, first we have to we have uh, the, our data here is uh, it's uh, hy hypothetical data of waiting time that people spend waiting on a a phone on a phone call uh, a phone line system somebody calls into a company and this is the amount of time they spend waiting on times and so here we have all of our the number of seconds that people spend waiting when you have a histogram you also have to have another type of data on here called your bin ranges a bin is another name for basically the the width the of how uh, the width of the scale that you have on your x axis that you want to be able to show so for example in here we have it divided into five second increments so we've got five seconds 10 seconds 15 so that when we have our x axis the the the, the ticks at the bottom the, the the scale will be in widths of five seconds so each of our bars will then be in five second widths so to produce a histogram, it's a little bit different. We go up to the data tab instead of the insert tab. And then we go to our data analysis button over here. And that'll pop up several different types of analysis tools that you can do. But we're showing histograms here. So we want to show histogram. And then you click OK. And then there's a few steps that you have to do here, and I always I always forget one or two because I don't do histograms too often. But uh, so for our input range, our input range is the actual data set, the time that people spend waiting, for example. So we, you click here, and then you can click over here and actually select the data that you want to use for that, and it automatically populates over here. And then here in the bin range, this is basically telling Excel the scale that we want to use on our x-axis for our distribution. We go here and we select our bin range from basically from five seconds up to 80 seconds. Now it's important here to also then go on the output options to click chart output. I have a really bad habit of forgetting to click chart output and then it pops up with uh, just data and no chart and I'm left scratching my head going what have I done wrong so learn from my many mistakes <laughs> and then we click OK and when we click OK what it does is it's going to open up a new tab and that's where our chart is going to be and look I actually did it right for the first time ever so uh, we've we've got our histogram that shows you know it, it's produced a you know a standard uh, bell uh, kind of the, the usual bell chart that you see in statistics that shows that uh, the 45 second range tends to be around the most common and uh, you know if there were any outliers or anything like that it would be able to show you that so again i'm not a histogram expert uh, uh, but i just wanted to show you how you do that 
you know, your bin could then, these histograms could be adapted however you need. You know, if you, for example, you wanted to show uh, a distribution of incomes, for example, you, you know, if you had a pop, if you had a large data set with a hundred different uh, income levels, your, you know, you, you, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, whatever you have, your bin could then be, you know, the different range of incomes that you would have zero to 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 15. It, it, you basically define your width and that's basically did, dependent upon you uh, and your data and you uh, being mindful of you know, how you think that data needs to be needs to be displayed. So just a helpful tool there. I hope that help, helps a bit. Uh, I do want to show a scatter plot. I want to go reuse some of the data that I used a bit ago for the bar chart. Uh, to go back to the idea of uh, maternal mortality rates, you know, we had our, our deaths per 100,000 live births earlier. Now let's compare that against per capita GDP to see if there is any type of relationship. And taking our, or basically taking our, our data analysis to the next level. Per capita GDP, uh, basically being uh, the, the GDP divided by population. What is the average income per person in a country? I'm sure most of you know that, but just pointing that out. So uh, again, uh, this is a fairly uh, straightforward process. To produce this chart, we select our data. We go back up here to insert, and we go in here. And we have an XY scatter plot right here. And there it produces very quickly our, uh, our relationship. On, on the X axis here, we have the uh, deaths per 100,000 live births. And on our Y axis, we have per capita GDP. And it looks like there is some sort of uh, downward relationship where uh, the lower uh, a country's per, per capita GDP, uh, it looks like the higher the death rate is. So, you know, that's just an example of how you can use a scatter plot. And again, lots of ways that you can customize this to change colors. You could add a trend line, all sorts of options that you could do. And finally, I just want to show a line chart as well with a couple of different uh, variables on it. For example, temperature. I live in the U.S. state of Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. So I wanted to look at the average low and high temperatures for Maryland. Uh, in, these are in Fahrenheit. I don't have the Celsius. We use Fahrenheit here, so I, I, this is just the data available to me. Um, and this is a fairly easy, straightforward process to do as well. Now, you could do one variable or two variables in this situation. You could just show a single line chart with one line that just shows the low temperature. Uh, but in this case, let's show the high temperature. That allows us to kind of see the gaps between. So uh, we go ahead and we select all of our data. It's the same process as before. And it, on, on recommended charts, it's already popped it up, but we'll go ahead and go to all charts again, line chart, and it's our default option right here. And so, you know, this is just kind of a helpful, helpful way to show the, the, the low temperatures uh, per month and the high temperatures per month. Uh, and it's got the, the two different lines and you can see the, the gap between and, and it's fairly, Fairly straightforward. So I'll, I'll use this situation to show some ways that you can customize your charts as well. Let me blow this up a little bit so it's a little easier to see. There are a lot of options on how we could customize this. Um, and I'm not going to be thinking about accessibility right here. I'm just going to be showing examples of how to, how to customize so that you can think about ways to adapt it for yourself as well. Um, the first thing would be colors. I think Excel has actually done an okay job of showing different a, a color contrast here. Blue and orange is a decent contrast, but uh, you know, let's we can change that a little bit right now to show. Say, for example, instead of orange, we wanted to use red. So we literally, I can literally select the line that I want to change the color, right click, and since it's in, since it's a line, it's uh, the line is has has an outline color. So we would go to outline. If it would let me, there we go. And we could change that to red very quickly. Easy to do. And say the blue, we just didn't like that shade of blue for some reason. I don't know, it doesn't show, it doesn't look cold enough. We can look a, a colder shade of blue. So there we go. We very quickly changed our colors and that took seconds to do. And 
there are a lot of other ways that we can customize this as well. Say, for example, we didn't want to have the grid lines. I think the grid lines are somewhat helpful in this case, but just as an example of, well, we didn't want to, we, we didn't want to have grid lines. When we left click on our chart here, we have three different options that pop up here. This first one is called chart elements, and it's, uh, it's always one of my best friends. It allows you to make lots and lots of tweaks. You can add or remove axes. In this case, I think the axis is helpful. You can decide whether or not you want to have a chart title. Uh, your data labels can be listed on there. Your, your data table can even be added on here. You can, uh, you can have uh, your legend. You can decide whether or not you want to take off the legend, which in this case, the legend is uh, low temp versus high temp. Uh, but for, say, for example, we didn't want to have our grid lines. We can easily take that off, and it's immediately a, a, a cleaner looking table right away. But say uh, and we didn't, we wanted to make a, some adjustment to our to our axis. We, all, we I mean, right now it's showing everything from zero to hundred, which is helpful. But you know we don't have any data that goes anywhere down to zero or anything up to hundred. So we can make very quickly adjust the our axis as well. Oh, I just saw a question pop up. Oh, okay. So when we so when we, we we left click over here on on the axis of ours over here, which is the temperature, then when we right click, we can format our axis. And the bounds is the interesting part here that we want to think about. But right now, our bounds are our minimum is zero degrees, our maximum is one hundred degrees. Well, we don't have anything that goes down to zero. So you know, let's say we want our minimum to be. See, we don't have anything lower than 20. Let's say 20 degrees. And our maximum would be, uh, we don't have anything above 90, so we'll say 90. And again, I'm not saying this is the best way to necessarily show it. I just want to give you examples of how you can, how you can show the differences in your scale and, and, and in, in your chart. Ultimately, this is your chart and your, your data. And you get to display it however, however you think is helpful. So. Uh, when you go when we go back here, our legend is currently on that shows our low our, and high temperature as well. So right now it's here on the on the right. You, you can see the low and high temperature, and that that looks fine. But say for whatever reason, depending on the formatting of your presentation, you needed it to be at the bottom. Your boss says it has to be at the bottom. Well, that's fairly quickly and easy to do. It, you just you click this little arrow over here, and it allows you to put it wherever you want. You put it at the top, the left the right, the bottom, whatever you want. So, I mean, that's been what, one minute of customization and we've all, we've already been able to make a lot of, <laughs> a lot of different changes. I'm not saying these are better or worse. I'm just saying, this is how you can quickly and easily make tweaks. Now, another helpful uh, thing that I mentioned earlier is chart titles. You know, chart title is not a compelling title for a chart. <laughs> uh, if you decide you don't want your chart title, when you go up to this chart element here, you can unclick the arrow, uh, this, this box that has that is checked for chart title, uh, and you can remove it altogether. Or uh, in our case, it, we, we can just make a quick change to it. So changing the chart title is extremely easy, and I'm sure many of you already know how to do this. We we click on our chart, and then we we click on the chart title itself here, and it, puts the little box around it. When that box is around it, that's its way of saying that you can now make edits and you can make edits, you can select, you can select your chart title and then you can very quickly and easily adjust it. Uh, type whatever you want, figure one, average temps in Maryland. Not saying that's a good title or a bad title, I'm just trying to show an example. And then say you wanted to go to the next step even further and uh, you wanted to make the chart a title bold and italics, for example, to make it pop out even more. You just select all the text in here, which you can either double click or all of that, or you can you know, physically select all of it. And when you go up here under the home tab, you have your options for your text. Right now it's size 14, it's not bold, anything like that. Say we wanted to make the color, we wanted to make the color dark blue, and we wanted to make you just select the color of your text here. 
and we want it to make it bold and italicized. And there we go. We've got a, 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 a customized title to, to help with telling your story. One thing that I don't really like in Excel is that it doesn't allow you to adjust the width of the title to go all the way across. That It's just kind of a default option. Uh, you can adjust the location of your title. You can move it over, for example. Like I'm, I've selected it and I'm physically dragging it over here. Say we can move it over here. But say we had a longer title, it won't allow me to, to basically make the width go from all the way to the left, all the way to the right. It doesn't allow us to do that, unfortunately. So, you know, we, we have some limitations, but say, for example, this here is a, a little bit more of a compelling title than chart title. So just some things to get you thinking for how to present your data. I want to go back uh, to the bar chart that we showed earlier as well, just because, you know, this is an option. This is a situation where our default data visualization is okay, I guess, but there's ways to tell a story fairly quickly. Uh, I'm going to blow it up a little bit so that we can, first of all, see all of our data here. Unfortunately, there, we had so many categories of data that it cut some of the names of the countries off, so we weren't able to tell what we were looking at right away. So I, I literally just uh, dragged it and then pulled it at the bottom here to make it larger or smaller. Right now, it's sorted alphabetically. Uh, looks like uh, uh, Vietnam to Brunei, B to, to V, going from bottom to top. That isn't necessarily the best way to sort data like this. I mean, it's helpful, but it's not, it's not the most helpful. In this situation, it's more helpful to go to data and sort our data up here. So to do that, we select our data, and we go up to our data, our helpful data tab at the top of Excel, and we sort. Oh, sweet sort. Oh, I know what I did wrong. Oh, we're, we're, we want to sort by depth, uh, smallest to largest, for example. And there we have, and that, that shows us that uh, a, a bit more of an interesting data visualization right away. It shows, you know, where are where is the maternal uh, mortality rate highest and lowest. And say we want to change the color of these. Say we want to go back to my example of lime green. Uh, if we select one of the bars here, it automatically selects all the bars for us. When we go back to home tab, we can adjust our fill color and say, you know, lime green is my option. I like this shade of lime green. Another thing to keep in mind when choosing uh, when choosing your color, if one of these colors isn't one you want to use, all you have to do is go down here to more colors. And you can select any color imaginable. Say uh, you wanted to have this, uh, say you wanted to have uh, um, this shade of green. You know, you can have any color you want, but you know, for now, let's, we'll make them all lime green. But say I wanted to really point out, uh, I want, in, in, the, in this case, we wanted to show Mongolia, for example. We wanted to make our eyes uh, go to Mongolia. So I want to make the other bars a little less noticeable so I can make that a, a lighter shade of green. And then I can double click on the Mongolia option here, and it only selects Mongolia. And we can go back up here, and then we can go back up here and make that a more vibrant shade of green and then unselect. So now we are you now we've got all our data presented, but the eye immediately goes here to show to show Mongolia's rate, for example. So that's just a, a helpful uh, way to show how to make these colors pop. <laughs> um, I want to show one additional bonus data visualization here. This is data that's broken out by geographic location, by country. Uh, there's a very helpful and neat, uh, tool that you can actually depict uh, a, a map, a, a heat map that shows uh, the the deaths, uh, the the death rate uh, as a heat map on a, on an actual map. 
Excel allows you to do these as well. So we go back up here into insert and one of our recommended share charts is a map. And we can select that right away and it pops up a uh, helpful map. Say we wanted to do one of those. So that shows that the lighter the color, the lower the maternal uh, uh, mortality rate and the, the darker the shade, the, the higher the rate is. So that's just another way to allow your, your, your audiences to quickly and easily be able to uh, understand what what message you're trying to convey. Uh, I do want to show one additional resource. I, I've been showing Microsoft Excel. I do want to uh, note that you know Microsoft Excel you know cost money. I use Microsoft 365 through my business. It's a couple hundred dollars per year to use that, so that can be a, a barrier. It is possible to use Google Sheets as well, which is a free resource. I am not nearly the expert in Google Sheets, uh, but I do uh, know that it is an option. I'm going to stop sharing real quick so I can pull up my Google Sheets. Let me share the screen again. So this is going back to the option of the pie chart that I showed earlier, the, the same data that I presented in Microsoft Excel, but now we're in Google Sheets. It's just as easy to produce pie charts in here in Google Sheets as it is in Excel. We select our data, we go into insert, and then we click chart. And it, it knew right away that we wanted a, that we wanted a pie chart. Uh, under part, under chart type, we could go in here and select whatever chart type we wanted here. But in this case, Google uh, knew that we wanted a pie chart. And then we can make our customizations. Uh, uh, say we wanted a, uh, our background color to be red for some reason or, or blue or whatever we wanted. Uh, we don't want any of that, but you know, our, our, our border can be adjusted here. Our fonts can be adjusted here. Uh, all sorts of things can be adjusted very quickly in Google Sheets. So there's lots of options in Excel and Google Sheets. The point I'm trying to get across here is that uh, you just have to be willing and able to spend a few minutes to go beyond the defaults. This is your data. Uh, it's your story that you're trying to convey. Be creative and see what you want you you can create. So. Um, yeah, I think that was the end of the demonstration that I had. I, I, I know it was kind of a whirlwind trip, and I know that a lot of you probably know a lot about this already, but I just wanted to show some of the helpful tools to take your data to that next level. And uh, if any of you have any questions, I know I'm approaching the end of my time, and I know it's getting late there as well, so I don't want to drone on too much longer. So thank you all for your time. I'll, if you have any questions, I'm happy to help if I can. What would I work, recommend on word clouding? You know, that's a great question. Honestly, I think that's a very helpful tool, especially if, uh, when you're when you have a qualitative evaluation. Uh, I've used word clouds quite a bit. I don't I don't find word clouds to be the most helpful tool. I think they're helpful in getting us thinking about what themes are prominent, but. Um, I haven't had much success getting Excel to produce a word cloud, unfortunately. Um, I've I, I've had to use more uh, uh, more sophisticated systems like um, Invivo or Deduce, or I'm currently using Max QDA. Um, there might be some other helpful resources out there. You know, uh, Tableau uh, would probably have a way to do that, but I just don't know the best way to do that in Excel. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I, I, you know, I hate when my when my answer has to do that. Do I study Python? No, I I have not had a chance to study Python. I'm a generalist, honestly. I have a my training is uh, is in the humanities. <laughs> honestly, I kind of uh, got into evaluation later on, but uh, no, I I uh, I have not had a chance to study Python. That might be a a good way to use word clouds as well. I don't know if Python can use word clouds as not, but Python R, so many of these other more sophisticated systems are definitely other options. You know, Excel is just kind of a little bit more of an accessible way to to get your foot in the door when in terms of data visualization. But you know, for those of you who with uh, with with smarter technical brains than mine, I definitely encourage you to go on to the next level and into Python and R and 
Tableau and these other tools that are out there. You know, we're, it's a great time to have so many powerful tools at our disposal. And, you know, I hope Excel can be useful for, for some of you, especially some of you uh, getting started in, in your evaluation career and, uh, you know, in your studies. And uh, it, it can definitely be helpful for, uh, for dissertation level research and things like that. But uh, uh, there are definitely other tools out there. I, I appreciate that comment. And the screen share there. So if uh, if anybody if nobody else has any questions, I can turn the time back over. And uh, I know it's uh, it's late there, and uh, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to be part of your evenings with everybody. It's been wonderful to to get to know all of you, and uh, I, I wish everybody the best. Uh, I my I can share my LinkedIn as well. It was on the presentation, but uh, feel free to. Uh, connect with me as well. I, I always uh, love uh, making new connections all over the world and learning from all of you. Uh, that uh, you know, I've shared some of my tools that I use in my consulting practice, but so many of you have uh, more sophisticated tools as well. And uh, I'm grateful to know all of you. Thank you, thank you for yourself. So, like, because yeah. Data visualization is so one part of like the work when you're doing the evaluation for like it takes time. <laughs> for me, for me, it's 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 kind of difficult thing. Like I prefer to just write it, it write the sentences and do the narratives, but the yeah, visualizing data is yeah, that is the hardest part for me because. I I'm not like kind of person who is like uh, good at visualizing things. I just prefer telling you more about me. I'm very much the same. I'm a writer that uh, likes, but but I've learned over the years that sometimes our audiences only have maybe two minutes to get through your report, and sometimes the visuals are there to supplement and support your writings but the the writing and the narrative is where you de can definitely go into your details so i i appreciate that point so much yeah you select the colors and the and the type of charts which 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 chart is suitable it's just thinking that that it takes time <laughs> okay uh, is there anyone else to Ask a question. If we don't have any more questions, let's end our session today here. And now I want to invite Ms. Irkin Jimmy for the closing remarks of our three days training. Because from the beginning, we started from the general understanding and the background information of the evaluation. And then we studied about the logic model development, which is also very helpful. And then we learned about the equity design approach. Yeah, and today's session was really like practical and helpful. So let's conclude our training. Yes. Thank you very much, Dennis, uh, for your time to share about your expertise and also show with us some practical Sorry. Sorry, some noise from my daughter. Yeah, so uh, we really much appreciate your contribution to our capacity building session and to also set uh, for the very uh, innovative tool that you demonstrated for us. And thank you very much, Olga, for facilitating, for being a great facilitator for these three days. And for all our interns and those who attended the session for three days. So here we conclude um, the first uh, three, uh, first capacity building workshop we um, had. With, in collaboration between Mongolian Evaluation Association Evaluate Chapter, American University. And um, I hope it will be um, the beginning of many more in the future. 
uh, and then um, we look forward also to the eight, uh, series, eight series of capacity building workshop in May and June, also the Mongolian evaluation case competition and the summer boot camp. Uh, in, in all of those, we will be also partnering with American University in some way or another. Um, so um, uh, without further ado and many more words, it's quite late here. And then, so I would like to thank everyone uh, for starting this journey. And then I wish all the best for your learning and then uh, do not be discouraged. It's a good process. It's a process that we all learn together in this uh, boat. And so I encourage you to stay tuned with our social media channels and have a good night, everyone. And have a good day, uh, Dr. Peters, Dennis, and Seth. Thank you very much. Over, over. Thank you. And I also want to ask everyone open their camera and share your thoughts and feedbacks and comments about mm -hmm. the and like you can share what was your takeaways from our training, etc. So anyone who wants to share your thoughts, please welcome. No one? <laughs> which which means what? It was bad? <laughs> okay. So um yeah, we will do the photo session again. Before before the photo session, I, I'd like to ask everyone that uh we have uh we have, we will collect the post training feedback from you guys. So please fill out our form before Monday. It would be very helpful for us to improve our next uh, sessions and next activities and learn from uh, you guys. So I, I just shared the link of the post training server here, and I will also send you guys it through an email. So please fill out this form. Yeah, so let's do the last here. And also, uh, sorry, I want to say thank you for uh, Evaluation Association and the Evaluation, the, 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 those organizations who are conducting this uh, Youth and Evaluation Week and uh, capacity building. So the, for me, who uh, have never learned about evaluation, it was, it's been a great journey. The, the three days, I learned it a lot especially Mr. Dennis' presentation, um, that Excel uh, uh, resolution was great. Like I, I can use it in, in uh, many ways, like even like uh, not uh, in the monitoring or no evaluation, like a project or I can use it in my daily life. Like um, I can, use it in my work so thank you okay everyone let's do the final practice session once more please open your camera and then you can go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> okay do, do we have everyone with their cameras on Everyone turn their cameras on, please. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll take a picture on three. One, two, and three. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye, Fab. Bye, Fab. I'll stop the recording. Bye, Fab.